Hi, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Mark Dubois, the CEO of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. The historic Abraham Accords between Israel, the UAE, and Bahrain were the first in a new wave of normalization agreements where Israel and Gulf countries have come together around common interests and aspirations. It also allows these countries to enhance their cooperation and coordination in addressing mutual concerns, chief amongst them, the threat from the Islamic Republic of Iran. To better understand how these three countries are working to counter the threat from the regime in Iran and their assessment of the policies of the incoming Biden administration and how those policies will impact them, we're very grateful to have three of the leading diplomats who were responsible for this historic breakthrough. As you know, FDD is a nonpartisan national security and foreign policy think tank. We don't take foreign government funding and we run a series of programs throughout the year that deal with important foreign policy and national security issues. And we're very grateful for the support of the Shulman Foundation for making this event possible. If you're interested in learning more about our work and our areas of focus, please visit our website at fdd.org. And with that, I'm very pleased to introduce our guest today. His Excellency Yusuf Al Oteba has served as the ambassador of the United Arab Emirates to the United States since 2008. In recognition for his service, he was promoted to Minister of State in 2017. His Excellency Sheikh Abdallah bin Rashid Al Khalifa has served as the ambassador of the Kingdom of Bahrain to the United States since 2017. And His Excellency Ron Dermer has served as Israel's ambassador to the US since 2013. Previous to that, he served as a senior advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. We're very grateful to these three gentlemen for making the time to join us today. Well, gentlemen, it's great to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I want to talk about the, the threat from the Islamic Republic of Iran. And, and the title of this event is On the Same Page. Um, you represent three countries that are in, uh, within Iranian missile range. And the, uh, the Biden administration is obviously going to be consulting closely with our European allies, who up to now are not within Iranian missile range. And so what I want to do is start with your perspective on this, this threat and ask you, all three of you, straight out, do you oppose a return to the JCPOA? Do you want to start maybe with Ron? Well, it won't surprise you, uh, Mark, that we do oppose a return to the same nuclear deal in 2015. As you recall, uh, the prime minister forcefully opposed that and publicly opposed that at the time because it didn't solve the problem it was meant to solve meaning it didn't close the nuclear file. What it did, as you know, and I know FDD was involved in, in, in that effort to bring to the public's attention all the problems with the deal, but the main problem was that all the restrictions that the nuclear deal put in place were automatically removed in a few years. Uh, we've already started to see the removal of some of those restrictions after five years, the arms uh, uh, embargo. Uh, is, uh, is removed. And then in eight years, it's missiles. In 10 years, it's centrifuges. In 15 years, it's stockpiles. So all that had to happen was a change in the calendar uh, in order for there to be change. Iran didn't have to change any of its behavior. So we had a situation from Israel's point of view where a nuclear deal was on the table that didn't end the threat of a nuclear armed Iran, but it actually virtually guaranteed it. At best, it postponed a breakout for a few years, but that's it. And in addition to that, by removing all the sanctions, it also fueled Iran's quest for uh, conquest and carnage throughout the region. And my fellow uh, ambassadors know about that well because their countries are affected by it as well. And it, it's, it, it's not just in Bahrain and the Emirates, it's Iraq and it's Syria and Lebanon and Yemen throughout the region. So we did not think that this was a good deal. We thought it was uh, a very bad deal and one that should have been rejected at the time. Now, what we've learned since over the last five years is that deal did not do what its uh, proponents hoped it would do, meaning alter Iran's behavior, move them into the community of nations. It actually led Iran just to be much more aggressive and much more dangerous in the region. That was before the Trump administration came in. That was before the Trump administration changed their policy. And we in Israel appreciated very much the decision to withdraw from the nuclear deal, to restore those sanctions, and really to create this maximum pressure campaign, which has made it much more difficult uh, for Iran. Now, it didn't solve the nuclear problem with Iran, but neither did the deal. And I think right now, uh, the United States has basically been 
placed all of us in a position where Iran is facing enormous pressures. Uh, and it's important to keep that pressure on uh, in order to ensure that the full dismantling of Iran's military nuclear capability and also to rein in its aggression and terrorism in the region, which threatens all of us. So we are definitely opposed to going back to the same deal. And we hope the new administration will sit down with Israel, will sit down with the Emirates, with Bahrain, with its other allies in the region, talk to us because, you know, we live in the region. We know a little something about our own security. And just as in the case with North Korea, when you're doing negotiations with them, you would listen to Japan, you would listen to South Korea. And my guess is you'd listen to them even more than you'd listen to the British, French, and Germans. And I think the same case here, Israel and the Arab states are on the same page, as you say, when it comes to Iran. I think that means something. And I think they, we, we should um, hopefully can engage in that dialogue with the new uh, Biden administration and hopefully find that common ground moving forward. So thanks, Ron. Uh, Yusuf, I want to go to you next. Do you, uh, do you oppose the return to the JCPOA? If so, if so, why? I, I think it's important to understand and note that the region in 2021 is very different from the region in 2015 when JCPOA was negotiated. I think the attitudes are changing, the mindsets are changing. You talk to young people, they're they're very forward-looking and very optimistic about the future of the part of the of our part of the world. And so the Abraham Accords are a reflection of that. But because of that change in the region, because of maximum pressure, because of COVID and because of low oil prices, I think there is a lot of leverage that the US has over Iran right now. And I think one of the things we should seriously consider doing is look at a bigger and better JCPOA 2.0, one that addresses the shortcomings of JCPOA 1.0. We thought it was a good start. We don't think it went nearly far enough. We don't think the voices of the region were represented at the negotiations. So I think what we would advocate is one, let's look at how to strengthen it and not cede all the leverage that you have up front. Let's bring in, let's strengthen the US diplomatic team and bring in your regional partners who tend to be aligned on this. I, I think we've been presented with a false choice, Mark. I think there's always been this dilemma that says, well, the US has to strengthen its partnerships and its relationships with the Europeans. That usually happens at the expense of its Arab partners. Or you strengthen its relationship with its Arab partners at the expense of the Europeans. I think that is a false choice. There is absolutely no reason why the US should not come in armed with its two partners from Europe and from the region, aligned on what a deal looks like, or at least our objective, and negotiate a deal that addresses missiles, that addresses proxies, that addresses interference. And I think we're well positioned to do that. We want a deal. We definitely want a deal. We benefit more than anyone else from a deal, but we want a deal that addresses all of Iran's challenges for the region. Thanks, Yusuf. Um, Abdallah, I wanna to go to you next. Again, um, Kingdom of Bahrain obviously faces grave threat from, from Iran. Um, both externally and internally. Do you oppose a return to the JCPOA? And, and if so, why? Well, Mark, here's the thing with the JCPOA that uh, addressed only the P5 plus one's global concerns at the expense of the GCC and Israel's security and, and welfare in the face of Iranians' um, asymmetric regional manipulations. When the JCPOA was signed, we were told that Iran was going to spend the proceeds on developing the country, building infrastructure, uh, schools, etc. Instead, we saw a huge increase in Iran's spending on its uh, dangerous proxies in the region, its asymmetric warfare, its ballistic missile program, uh, with almost nothing being invested in Iran itself. Uh, if I was to speak on a, on a micro level, uh, I mean, we saw a, a, a real IED attacks in Bahrain significantly increase in 2015. Uh, we had police officers that were uh, uh, attacked. Uh, there were attacks that were going on right next to a girl's school in one instance. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and uh, we've seen that continue for uh, 2016 and 2017. And so uh, from the start, Bahrain has always stood with the U.S. government's decision 
to withdraw from the JCPOA and apply a different approach with the Iranian regime. Uh, it was uh, always been part of the Iranian regime's plan as a scheme to distract the world from their domestic issues and what go, what's going on internally. One thing that needs to be said is that ever since the initiation of the US's campaign, um, the Iranian regime has consistently been testing the region's result uh, by initiating a provocative act in the form of a direct or indirect attack in an effort to identify the red line. And it would then operate just below that red line. And FDD knows that very well. We've seen it in some of uh, what you have put out. Um, at, the, at the end of the day, uh, we hope that an incoming administration will recognize that Iran's malign activities and ballistic missile capabilities are equally as troublesome to Iran's neighbors as its nuclear program is. Um, any return to the JCPOA uh, should take into consideration the concerns of Iran's neighbors, including the Gulf and Israel, those that have been on the forefront of Iranian aggression for 40 uh, years now. Um, we have a lot of evidence that can prove what the Iranians have been doing. Uh, we've brought it to our allies, uh, and uh, we hope that a different approach will be taken um, in order to push back on Iranian aggression in the region. So, Ron, let me ask you this. I mean, there's been an assumption in, in Washington, almost an exception, that the regime in Iran is 10 feet tall, um, that any attempt to counter the regime uh, will only lead to massive escalation, and that fundamentally it was a choice between the JCPOA and war. And yet, over the past number of years, uh, your military and your intelligence services have inflicted significant damage against the regime in Iran, uh, both in the region, in Syria, uh, particularly, and, and inside Iran. Um, and I wonder if you could comment on that. I mean, you're a small country, you've got a small military, a small intelligence service, and yet had some, some real successes against uh, the regime in Iran. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, first of all, it was always a false choice to say it was either uh, doing this deal or war. That was never the case. And the best proof of it is what happened when uh, President Trump withdrew from the deal. I mean, you didn't have war, we have peace. We're having this conversation today. Part of the reason why we're having this conversation and that an Israeli ambassador is sitting with a Bahraini ambassador and an Emirati ambassador is because of the strong and forceful posture of the outgoing administration regarding Iran. I think that was part of the reason that created the political space to allow for different things that were happening underneath the surface to surface. So it was never about this deal or war. It was a false choice, I think, in an, in an environment after Afghanistan and after Iraq to get people to rush and doing a deal thinking, you know, with diplomacy, diplomacy, we have to do it or else we're gonna be facing another war. I've never really believed that at all. And I actually think that uh, the, uh, the right policy regarding Iran, and this is something the Prime Minister of Israel has spoken about for 20 years, is a policy that has crippling economic sanctions, uh, that has a credible military threat of a breakout by Iran, and that also reaches out to the Iranian people who are partners. We don't have a problem with the people of Iran, we have a problem with the regime of Iran, and my guess is that both my counterparts agree with that because it's a radical regime that is trying to destabilize all the governments in the region, and it vows and works to destroy Israel. So that was always a false choice. You've also seen when the not only, you know, I'm not going to comment on supposed allegations against Israel uh, uh, inside Iran, but you know that we have um, acted very forcefully in Syria in order to prevent Iran from entrenching itself there. You also saw that in the wake of the decision uh, by President Trump to uh, take out, I think, one of the greatest dangers, not just to the region of the world, Qasem Soleimani, you saw the response of Iran, and they were deterred for the last year. They were deterred because of that action. Uh, before that, there was concerns that there was going to be an escalation, but the reason why there was an escalation is there wasn't forceful American power. Once that power was brought to bear, and I think it was brought to bear in the case of Qasem Soleimani, then it's deterred. And I would encourage a new uh, a Biden administration to make sure that that deterrence remains, to make sure that the Iranian regime knows 
that either uh, if they try to attack not only the United States, but attack American allies in the region, American interests in the region, that there will be a heavy price to pay. That is the way that ultimately you're going to deter Iran. And I want to just, before you go on, just comment on, on, on what was said previously. Um, I think Yusuf has a very, very important insight about all the leverage. And, and somebody brought to my attention just yesterday, sent me an article that was written, I think it was by Tom Friedman when the deal was signed. And he said, this is the best deal you can get with an empty holster. Well, guess what? You got pretty big guns in the holster right now. And it makes absolutely no sense to take those guns out and to throw it away and then simply go into a deal. And what Yusuf is talking about is going to 2.0. And I'm sure he agrees with me on this. You, the road to 2.0 does not go through 1.0. So the thing that you're hearing now is we will start by going to 1.0 and then we will work for a longer, broader deal. I wish that were possible, but I do not, I think it's a physical certainty or metaphysical certainty that if you go to 1.0 and you get rid of those guns in your holster, you get rid of all the leverage, you will never get to 2.0. There's a separate question, can you go to 2.0? Can you sit down with Israel, with uh, our Emirati, Bahraini and other allies in the region, forge a common position that would be a 2.0? That's a different discussion. But for that discuss to have any chance of reaching that destination, you have to use the leverage that you have to push Iran in that direction, to simply give up that leverage, to go to 1.0, and then to say we're going to dis uh, have talks, it simply makes no sense. There's no chance that that's going to happen. You will never get to a, better, a bigger and better deal, the likes of which Yusuf is talking about. Well, Yusuf, let me ask you about that, because, I mean, that, that obviously has been uh a criticism of, of the JCPOA, which is that its fundamental architecture uh, is fatally flawed, that this is not just a question of extending the sunsets or getting better inspection rights or including missiles in some way, that the fundamental architecture of the JCPOA is so fatally flawed uh, because Iran ultimately has fissile material and the ability to produce fissile material on its soil. It can expand to an industrial sized nuclear program it can use advanced centrifuges, which are easier to hide and give Iran a much easier sneak out option. Um, it's going to have near zero breakout as a result of this industrial sized nuclear program. And I think, as, as Ron said, I mean, the fundamental premise of the JCPOA is Iran agrees to temporary nuclear constraints in exchange for massive sanctions relief. So, I mean, how do, how do you respond to the argument that JCPOA one can lead to JCPOA two, or, or do you agree with Ron that there is a fundamentally there's a fundamental problem with respect to the architecture of this deal, a deal that ultimately is going to lead to billions of dollars to the regime to fund its destructive activities? So I, I think the problem with going from one to two is what would be the incentive to go back to two? or to continue to two if the sanctions relief has already happened. If you've driven the car off the lot and then you suddenly realize you wanna go back and get a better deal or a bigger discount, what's the incentive to get a bigger discount if you've already paid for the car up front? So I think, I, I don't wanna re-litigate the entire process, but what I think we did in JCPOA 1.0 was we used the strategy or playbook that we're gonna put pressure and sanctions Ultimately, that leads to a negotiation that brings us to some kind of deal. And I think what we're proposing here is exactly the same playbook, is we have pressure and sanctions. We do want to reach a negotiation, I think, with a broader and more expanded team of partners that have a stake in the region's security that reach to a bigger and better deal. We want a deal that addresses everything that brings more stability to the region. We benefit from that. And when we were negotiating our nuclear agreement with the United States back in 2008, we came up with what has been coined the gold standard. What's the gold standard? Civilian nuclear power in a safe and secure way that doesn't have enrichment and doesn't have reprocessing. We came up with that and we offered that as a model. We offered that as a model so one day when the US does negotiate with Iran, there's a template to follow. And I mean, it, it was incredibly widely and well received in Congress that we created this gold standard and everyone should follow the gold standard. The problem was your partners became 
sort of committed and assured to a gold standard that is safe and secure for nuclear power and your adversaries got a better deal. And so I, I think that's, that's the part I'd like to sort of revisit is how do we get a better deal that is safer? We have a model, we know what it would look like. And why, don't, why isn't that the bar that we are applying? Um, so I, I think we should have a high set of objectives not just on the nuclear side, but also on missiles and on proxies and on interference, because we have the leverage to back it up right now. And if you come to the table with, with your Arab partners and your European partners, I, I think you're demonstrating a stronger negotiating team, which ultimately would lead you to a better outcome. And Abdullah, I, I assume you agree with that, and I'd certainly love to hear your um, further insights on this. And I also wanted to ask you, to address um, Saudi Arabia, obviously, um, and the Saudi ambassador is not is not on this uh, on this call. Uh, we hope one day she will be. Um, but you've got a very close relationship with with Saudi Arabia, and could you comment a little bit on on the way Riyadh sees the threat from Iran, um, and collectively Bahrain and, and Saudi Arabia, the, the ways in which you think you can work closely with the UAE, with Israel, with some of your other allies in the region. Uh, to continue to put pressure on the regime in Iran and continue to work closely with the Biden administration so that your, um, your interests and your, um, and your concerns are addressed? Well, let me first start with building on what has already been said. Uh, in terms of uh, the nuclear aspect, um, not only are we concerned about Iran's use of its nuclear capabilities for military purposes, um, it's also concerning to see what the environmental hazards uh, might uh, arise from uh, just because of the proximity of the uh, uh, Boucher nuclear plant to Bahrain, I mean, and, and, and UAE and Saudi. I mean, uh, that nuclear power plant is closer to us than it is uh, geographically to Tehran. And so, um, the last thing we need is uh, in the region is, is another Chernobyl. So uh, there has to be some sort of uh, oversight to uh, um, the process that's going on in, in Iran. Uh, but also we're here to address the other issues that have touched our communities as well. Take for example, Iranian money laundering efforts uh, in, in countries like Bahrain, where we have confiscated a lot of material related to a bank that they have set up and they used it to funnel um, money from Iran through Bahrain and into Europe. I mean, we're talking about a whole uh, list of, uh, of activities that um, either take advantage of uh, some of the policies in the region where we're opening up, moving forward, um, and um, it's, it's becoming more and more concerning. Uh, cyber attacks are, are on the rise, we have seen that. Uh, and I think it's about time that we really address all what the regime is, is, uh, is going, uh, uh, is attacking with and um, uh, just continuing on a, um, uh, on a policy that has worked for the past three years. Uh, with, with, uh, with Saudi Arabia, I think that uh, I, I, can, I can speak for Bahrain, but uh, uh, with Saudi, we've obviously seen um, uh, uh, the struggle with, uh, with the attacks that have been going on from the Houthis. Uh, we've obviously seen that connection there. Uh, the US's recent designation uh, speaks volumes. And uh, at the end of the day, I think what we have seen in the region, in every country that has um, a problem, uh, it, it rallies back to Iran, whether it is the use of proxies in the region, uh, whether it's the use of um, groups that they are ideologically uh, aligned with, or um, groups that they don't necessarily see eye to eye on, uh, on a number of issues, but then they will work with them to get uh, to their goals. Um, and here I can state Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda, um, Houthis, uh, they have all played a part in destabilizing governments in the region. And it becomes more and more challenging 
when they have a financier like the Islamic Republic um, uh, pushing them to do more and more. So, so gentlemen, we've, we've talked about different instruments of power and obviously um, maximum pressure, at least from a US perspective, the tip of the sphere was, was economic leverage. And, and the concern obviously with the return back to the JCPOA is lifting that leverage and giving uh, the regime in Iran tens of billions of dollars to fund its destructive activities. The, the Abraham Accords seemed to me a real opportunity um, for your countries to create economic leverage on your own. Uh, and in fact, you know, fundamentally put companies to a choice between doing business with Iran or doing business with you. And, and all three of your countries, the Saudis, others in the region, you know, there's, there's tremendous economic opportunities. Do, do you see the Abraham Accords as providing an opportunity for your countries to exert your own leverage? Um, even if you have, a, let's say, a U.S. Treasury Department that is not going to be as aggressive in enforcing sanctions against the Islamic Republic? I'll, I'll ask you, Ron. I mean, I, I think you, you know, you've given some, some serious thought to Israeli economic power and, and the importance of power, of Israeli power, in, um, in not only securing your state, but in laying the foundation for, for the Abraham Accords. Well, let me just say, to think about the issue of, uh, of sanctions. Remember, Mark, because you were heavily involved and FDD was heavily involved in this debate five years ago. And I, I don't want to relitigate the whole debate, but it's important to look at things that were said that were completely proved to be completely false. One of the central arguments at the time in 2015, and also when the decision was made to withdraw from the nuclear deal, was that the entire edifice of international sanctions would collapse because if the U.S. were to do sanctions alone unilaterally, it would not have the bite and the power that this multilateral sanction regime. And I remember conversations with the most senior U.S. officials across the board, and I'm sure that Yusuf can remember because he was in Washington at the time, look, if we don't do this deal, the whole sanctions regime is going to collapse. And the argument that I made also publicly then was, look, if you force countries to choose between a $21 trillion U.S. economy and a $400 billion Iranian economy, they're going to do business with the United States. And that is exactly what happened. I mean, the U.S. economic pressure has been awesome. Now, it's not perfect. It's not hermetic. It takes time to get that in motion, but it's been truly awesome. And it really didn't matter over the last few years what foreign you know, officials of the EU and other uh, bodies in Europe, when they were saying, we're going to stay in the deal, we're wedded to the deal. But you guess what? British airlines and French oil companies and German banks decided they don't want to be part of the deal because they don't want to be connected to it. And so that power is still there. It's unilateral. You know, you can't be so much in love with multilateral diplomacy, which is always better than unilateral diplomacy. But don't kid yourself. It's American economic power when you're actually forcing people to choose that works. Now, you have an interesting idea. How can we leverage the alliance that we have, the new friendship that we had? And I know that's an interesting idea that we need to think through exactly how to do it. What I can tell you is I think the marriage between Israel and our partners in the Emiratis and Bahrain, when you com combine the entrepreneurship they have with the innovation that we have, I mean, the sky's the limit. And I think the best way for all of us to deal with Iran is from a position of strength. And there's no question that the Abraham Accords, in my view, it not only strengthens Israel, I think it strengthens the Emirates, and I think it strengthens Bahrain. Uh, and I think that's very important moving forward. And that's why Iran was so concerned about it, because they don't want to see any of our countries get strong. And the stronger we are, the more deterrence will work, and the more we'll be able to grapple with the broad range of threats uh, that Iran opposes. And I think if we were able to do that together, I think we're going to be much more effective than doing it separately. Yeah, no, I, listen, I, I agree wholeheartedly, obviously, but, but I think that the, my concern, Ron, is that the, some of the folks that made that argument back in 2015 are now acknowledging they were wrong, but are now flipping the argument and saying that because the United States has tremendous leverage, unilateral secondary sanctions leverage, they can afford to go back in the JCPOA, give all of this money, relieve the sanctions, and then if Iran doesn't conclude JCPOA 2.0, then they're going to snap back all of the sanctions and take all the money away. And I guess the concern I've got is that the reason it worked in 2018 to 2020 
is because you had an administration prepared to go unilaterally. And that in the face of nuclear escalation, nuclear blackmail and extortion by Iran was willing to face them down. Uh, I worry that uh, subsequent administrations may not be willing to do that. And in fact, if anything, in the face of Iranian nuclear escalation today, you've got an incoming administration saying, wait a second, we don't want to escalate with Iran, so we're going to go back in the JCPOA and, and lift all of the sanctions pressure. And I, I think to, to Youssef, you know, I wanted, I wanted to sort of build Can, I, can I just say before that, I don't want to monopolize the time, yeah. but just one thing, Mark, it's important to understand, and I'm sure that Youssef and Abdullah agree with me. We are not a thought experiment on a whiteboard in a building in Washington. We are real countries with real peoples. And it's what you said is very interesting for a foreign affairs article, but we have a responsibility to protect and defend our citizens. And what I can tell you without any shred of a doubt is that Israel is much safer today than it was four years ago. And I believe the Emirates are safer today than it was four years ago and Bahrain is safer today. So it's very nice that there are people, and I'm, I'm the bluntest of uh, the three ambassadors, that want to maybe roll the dice and have a thought experiment so they can prove they're right or wrong in so, at some cocktail party in Washington. But we're real nations with real peoples, and we have a responsibility to protect our security. The last thing you want to do is remove all those pressures, because we already saw what happened when you did. It, 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 we already saw what happened between 2015 and 2017. The problem got worse. Abdullah spoke about it. And it wasn't just in Bahrain. It was every single country. So when you're when you're allies in the region are telling you we are safer today than we were than we were four years ago why would you want to roll that dice what is the rush to go into the deal and the only argument that i've heard i don't go to all those cocktail parties but the only argument that i heard was you know guess what they're rushing to a bomb you know they're enriching at 20 percent. well guess what there's a way that you can deal with that you make a statement, a credible military threat, and you say, we are not going to let you break out to a bomb. And guess you spoke about the red line. The prime minister put up that red line in 2012 at the United Nation, you know, with the wild E. Coyote bomb that he drew that red line as clear as can be. And what was the red line? It was that Iran would not have a bomb's worth of medium and rich uranium at 20%. And guess what? Iran, who was going, they were going vertical, closer and closer, they went for a few more weeks just to say they weren't deterred by what the prime minister put out. And then they started moving horizontally under that line. I have no doubt that if the president of the United States makes it clear privately, publicly to the Iranian regime, he will not allow them to break out to a bomb. They will not do it. And then you can allow that pressure and the leverage that Yusuf was talking about to do its trick, try to get a common position with all of us and see if we can work out what he says is a bigger and better deal that actually solves the problem. And doesn't just uh, give, you know, pave a highway of gold for Iran to get a nuclear arsenal. So Abdallah and, and Yusuf, I want to go to you to, to respond to, to what Ron has, has laid out. So I, I think the best way to prevent a country that you have security concerns from about reaching an enrichment level that is dangerous and getting up to weapons grade is to not have an enrichment cycle. Hey, where can we find one of those models? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> Well, you know, I, you, you raised this earlier, and I, and I think it's a profound point. I mean, you have the gold standard the UAE agreed to, and you have the Iran standard that in 2015 the United States conceded to. Um, and you're sending out a very interesting message. You're sending out a message that if you're an ally, we don't trust you with a nuclear fuel cycle. But if you're an enemy and the leading state sponsor of terrorism, we do. Um, and that obviously has some serious consequences for the, the question of nuclear proliferation not only in the Middle East, but in Northeast Asia and around the world. Um, but I'm trying to set it as, a, as an objective, as a negotiating tactic, or as at least a, as, a, as a way to get to a place where that makes all of us safer here in the region with all our partners. There is really no logic why your partners can have a program that doesn't have enrichment and reprocessing, but your adversaries do. And, and I think that's the message I want people to understand. We did this so there can be a template or a model so when you negotiate with the Iranians, so you, you, want, you want safe, secure nuclear power? Well, there's the model. That's how it works. That's why it's called the gold standard. And I think we have an opportunity to present that because, again, of all the leverage that you have today. Yeah, I mean, I, I find it fascinating and, and um, interesting that 
your three countries are on the same page with respect to the fact that Iran should not get enrichment and reprocessing and that Iran should not, this regime should not have the ability to produce fissile material on its soil where there are countries like the UAE and by the way, dozens of others who have peaceful civilian nuclear programs who buy their nuclear fuel from abroad and are not producing it on their soil, but somehow there should be this exception for the leading state sponsor of terrorism to have that fissile material. I mean, um, I, I, don't, I don't wanna be speaking for both of my colleagues, but I think we're on the same page in that we want a deal. We want a bigger and better deal. We want a deal that is more durable and sustainable. We want a deal that ultimately allows us to live in peace, that allows us to live in stability, that allows us to benefit from the Abraham Accords and increase trade and investment and bilateral and technology and research. I mean, that's the, ultimately the spirit of the Abraham Accords. We want to benefit from it, but we want a deal that in, allows us to do that safely and without, without risk. Abdul, let me ask you, because um, we certainly, from, from, this, from this event, uh, from discussions in Washington, from communications from your leaders, um, your three countries are clearly on the same page with respect to the threat from Iran. Let, let, let's talk about some other, other countries in the Gulf um, so re recent moves towards some kind of reconciliation with Qatar. Um, where, where do you see that evolving? Do you see Qatar becoming more on the same page or less on the same page with respect to the threat from Iran going forward? Well, as a, as a GCC and as a unit, we, uh, we always wanted to work closer with one another. Um, the, the whole idea behind building the GCC was uh, to become stronger together, unified. Um, yes, countries will have their foreign policies that are a little bit different than, than others. I mean, uh, the Amanis, for example, they had relations, uh, they still do with the Iranians, uh, but that, that didn't mean that they would not be um, an active member of the GCC. Um, but uh, it, it, the issue with the Qataris in the past was uh, a, um, a, 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 a a, a, a way that they worked in parallel, let's say. Um, one where they are supportive of coalitions from within the GCC, and uh, at the same time, they would work with those on the other side. Um, now, uh, today we're in a, a unique situation where uh, right after the meeting in Al Ula, uh, statements were put out, and we are very hopeful that the uh, Qatari uh, government will uh, uh, move towards a, a, a faster reconciliation with uh, its neighbors and uh, play a, a, a productive role in uh, strengthening the stability and security in the region. That's what we have been doing uh, time and time again. Uh, when you look at, uh, for example, the International Maritime Security Construct, a lot of people thought that it was put together to deter a certain country in the region, whereas um, it was basically to uh, make sure that the waterways are open for commerce, open for uh, uh, those to, to come in and out of uh, the region. And so uh, I think what we are looking for in the region today uh, and specifically today in Bahrain, we are celebrating the uh, Day of Diplomacy. Um, and uh, the slogan that we have chosen is, uh, is peace, because we would like to see peace in the region as a whole. Uh, all these initiatives have brought us to a point where um, we have shown that uh, peace is, is achievable uh, if you're on the right side. And uh, going back to your question with the Qataris, I think that uh, it's important for them to uh, reassess their relationships and to play a more productive role uh, in, in strengthening the security and stability of the region as a whole. And, and Yusuf, I'd love you to weigh in as well on this question of, of Qatar and Iran and, and also Turkey. I mean, it seems like in recent weeks that Erdogan has been making um, some overtures to Israel and to Saudi Arabia in particular it seems to have some, uh, some serious concerns about the new administration and the bipartisan uh, opposition to Erdogan's behavior in Congress. Um, do, you, do you see the possibility of a new posture from Doha and Ankara with respect to Iran or is it going to be sort of same old, same old? So I think the, the truth is it's too early to tell. 
I think we just signed uh, the reconciliation, the GCC reconciliation deal on January 5th, so just about 10 days ago. I think it's a good first step. It's a promising first step. Uh, it addresses some of the operational issues like travel and visas and things like that and shipping, but we still haven't addressed the fundamental issues that caused the rift. You know, support for the Muslim Brotherhood and other groups, relationships with Iran and Turkey, that is the next step, resolving what caused the problem in the first place is ultimately what we want to reach to. So right now, it's, it's like a couple who just decided to get back together for the sake of the kids, but we really haven't worked out the issues yet. We hope to work them out. But the, the, the final the decision ultimately comes down to Qatar. And it's very simple. Is, is Qatar's relationship with the GCC partners, with the UAE and Saudi and Bahrain and Egypt and others, is that more important? Is that the priority or is its relationship with Turkey and Iran the priority? And I, I can't answer that question. They have to answer it. But that's ultimately what really led to the rift. We're trying to reconcile. We're trying to fix our problems. Like uh, Sheikh Abdullah said, you know, we're, we're all about peace and de-escalation. But, you know, the Qataris have a decision to make and they need to decide which is more important for them. Is it us? <laughs> is it our team or is it the other team? So Ron, both Abdallah and Yusuf have, have talked about peace, uh, their, their vision for peace in the region. Um, you know, we're, we're all old enough uh, to have lived through and remember the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, it seems from my vantage point that the Arab-Israeli conflict is, is winding down. Um, and in fact, uh, there may not be an Arab-Israeli conflict, God willing, in, in, you know, in a few years. Is that your perception from, from Jerusalem? Uh, and if so, I mean, what, what, what are the consequences for that with respect to this, this coalition against, uh, against Iran? Well, I said uh, soon after the breakthrough, uh, the first breakthrough with the Emirates, and then it was followed subsequently about a month later with a breakthrough with Bahrain, that we could look back at 2020 as the beginning of the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And since then, you had Sudan, and of course, Morocco and others. And, and I have no doubt, by the way, that if the incoming administration pursues similar policies, obviously there's going to be a change between this administration and that administration. But if the basic policy, which I think is, you know, confront Iran, embrace your allies in the region, and leave a door open to peace with the Palestinians, but don't give them a veto over this entire region. If they pursue that policy, you will have others. And we could look back at this moment in time as being the beginning of the end. And that is certainly our hope. What also gives me hope is to see the response to the breakthrough, which was very different than the response to the breakthrough that happened 40 years ago with Sadat. Because when Sadat made his gesture, which is an act of remarkable courage, physical courage, political courage, with a breakthrough and going to Jerusalem and ultimately signing the peace agreement with us in 1979, that was rejected by every Arab state in the region, by Arab peoples throughout the region. Egypt was thrown out of the Arab League and, Sad and uh, Sadat ultimately paid for that peace with his life. Uh, even though he received a pretty big concessions from Israel at the time in, in the Sinai, which is about three times the size of Israel. Now, fast forward 40 years when Sheikh Mohammed takes a courageous decision and you know, breaks through towards peace, uh, making peace with Israel. How did Arab governments in the region respond to it? Several of them openly supported it. Others were silent about it. And you know how to read the tea leaves in the Middle East or the coffee grinds. I don't know what's the right analogy. But the silence also speaks volumes as well. And there were very few players who were opposed to it. In fact, Yusuf and Abdullah were talking about that. It's, it was, it was uh, the Palestinians were opposed to it, not uh, simply because they wanted to continue the veto not because this wasn't a concern of, of either the Emirates or Bahrain to ensure that the Palestinians, we could move forward in peace with them. They just wanted to have that veto power. Iran was totally opposed to it because the last thing they want is for us to, do, to be together and all our countries to be stronger. The Qataris were opposed to it and the Turks were opposed to it. And I, if memory serves, it's not that long ago, it's about five months ago, the Turks were threatening to remove their ambassador from the Emirates. Now, here's a news flash to people on this call. Turkey and Israel, you know, we have embassies in each other's countries for decades. They were actually the first Muslim country to make, uh, uh, to have diplomatic relations with us. So that idea was, 
it was almost wild when I saw it at the time. And, and my hope is that the response, I think, tells you a lot about what is happening in the Middle East. The response not of the governments, but also the peoples. And we could see that this peace that is emerging is not simply a peace between the top down of Sheikh Mohammed and King Hamad. It is also from the bottom up. You see it percolating among the people. I mean, we might have a situation, Mark, that there may be more Jewish weddings in Dubai and Abu Dhabi than they're going to be, I don't know if it's in Philadelphia, Baltimore, or New York. I mean, you can see that there is a genuine warmth um, and a willingness to embrace this peace. And we had high hopes, I can tell you. I had high hopes, but it's even exceeded my high expectations. And we have a little side bet, Yusuf and I, about the number of Israelis who are going to go post-COVID. We're setting the over-under. We're in Super Bowl season now, but the over-under is a million. If anyone on the call wants to uh, uh, wants to take bets, I think it's going to go over a million, and it's going to be hard to find an Israeli in two, three, four years that had not visited uh, the Emirates or Bahrain. It's going to be hard to find them. You're really going to have to uh, to look in the recesses of uh, of distant towns to find somebody who didn't make that trip. And I think that bodes very well the embrace of this piece, not just from the top down, but from the bottom up. And I also hope that it will lead to a change in the peace that we have, the current peace we have with Egypt and Jordan, which has been unfortunately a cold peace, which is certainly better than a hot war, but we would like to see a warming of that peace. And there have been forces in those countries, political, economic, and culture, cultural, who have militated against peace. I don't see those forces in either the Emirates or Bahrain. I see forces trying to encourage peace. And if we can prove, and this is really, I mean, we started this process, let's say, and our leaders gave us the backing in order to achieve these breakthroughs, because without their confidence in us, none of this would have happened. But now that we have that breakthrough, we have to ensure that it's a success. We have to ensure that everybody in the region knows that this piece is a huge success, that it actually strengthens all of our countries. People invest into success, and success breeds more success. You know, I, I knew exactly five Chicago Cubs fans uh, five years ago. And then all of a sudden the Cubs win the World Series and they all, you know, they're, they're like mushrooms all over the country. When we turn this piece into a winner, you're going to see more and more countries that follow. And I, and I was encouraged, and I'm sure my counterparts were as well, that one of the rare moments, and maybe the only moment, during the campaign, which was very heated and very polarized, and American politics obviously is hugely polarized today, a singular moment of consensus was the Abraham Accords, where statements were made by then candidate Biden and soon to be, you know, President Biden and candidate uh, Harris and soon to be Vice President Harris, that they supported this and they're looking to build on it. So we were very encouraged by that. And we hope we can continue to expand the peace outward to deepen the current peace that we have and ultimately to lead to peace between Israelis and Palestinians as well. Because I think the old approach was let's get the Israeli-Palestinian peace fixed and then Israel will have peace with 21, 22 Arab states. And that was almost tautological. Yes, that's true if we could do that. But what if we do it the other way around? What if we can first end the Arab-Israeli conflict and then see the momentum behind that, the tailwind that that provides to then engage the Palestinians, to empower those moderates among the Palestinians who actually would like to reach a historic compromise with us, to empower them and to marginalize those extremists, whether it's Hamas or other terror factions, to marginalize them and say, guys, you know what? The Arab world and the Muslim world is not behind you. Yes, they want you to have a better future. Yes, they want you to have self-determination, but they want you to reach a historic compromise. And I think when we all stand together, it sends a very powerful message. And one last thing, which is a, because I know this is a short answer to a long question, but one last thing. One thing I didn't anticipate, I'm not so sure if Yusuf and Abdullah are aware of it, but I've seen this happen now in Israel. The impact that this is having on our Israeli Arab population. You know, the dream of Israel's founders was that the Israeli Arab population, our Arab citizens of Israel, would be a bridge between Israel and the Arab world. And it didn't work out that way for various different reasons. But right now, there is great excitement among the 20% of our population 
who are Israeli Arabs, because now they're traveling to the Gulf, they're coming back. There is a tremendous excitement there. So not only are the Abraham Accords leading to greater coexistence between Israel and Arab states beyond our borders, it's actually leading to greater coexistence between Arabs and Jews within our borders. And I think that is a great blessing, something I didn't anticipate, but it's happening uh, and it's gaining steam. Well, Ron, thank you. I mean, listen, that, that would actually be a great note to end on, but I, I don't want to quite end on it yet. Um, but, you know, the-, the You've got to end on something pessimistic. I hear you. Always in Washington, <laughs> always. No, actually, I, I think there's also another note of optimism that really builds on this. But I, I, I want to bring Abdallah and, and Yusuf into the conversation on this because, you know, you can, you can sense Ron's enthusiasm, his passion. I mean, this sort of vision for- what the Middle East could look like um, and what his country could look like in terms of the relationships between uh, Jews and Arabs inside Israel. Are, are you sensing the same level of excitement and enthusiasm in your own countries? Uh, and, you know, Yusuf, if you want to, if you want to go next. So one of the more memorable, I, I got so many messages and photos and tweets and things that were sent to me, like in, in the aftermath of the Abraham Accords, they were all positive and exciting and people being hopeful. But the one I really remember was a young uh, Emirati friend of mine from Dubai, a big businessman in Dubai, but he was young, flying to Israel in his Arabic traditional clothes, not in jeans and a T-shirt, in his Arabic clothes and a mask on, taking selfies of himself at uh, Ben-Gurion Airport. So there's just, there's a lot of excitement about discovering this country that for most of people's lives was told it was taboo. Uh, you can't go there. You're not allowed to talk to them. It's a bad country. We don't like them. And all of a sudden, all these taboos are gone. Yeah, people can travel, people can invest, people can trade, people can research. To me, the most exciting part about this whole thing is not just the jobs that are gonna be created or the technology is gonna be unleashed or the, you know, the research that's gonna be done together. I think just on a very basic human level, if people look at each other with a little more understanding, a little more tolerance and respect and get to know each other, get to understand each other. And I say this from a very personal note because I was born and raised in Egypt and all of us basically grew up programmed that Israel's is the enemy. Egypt has a lot of wars with Israel. They've had land issues. There was a fight over the Sinai. It's just bad blood. We don't have that in the Emirates. You know, so my 10 year old son is going to grow up fundamentally different than how I grew up. He's going to grow up thinking it's totally normal to go visit Israel. He's going to grow up thinking it's totally normal to do an investment deal with Israelis, which is very different than how I grew up to me. And again, maybe it's the personal aspect of how I grew up. To me, that's the most important part. We are a country that is really, really invested and focused on the future. We want to make our country better, stronger, safer. We want to create jobs. We want to create prosperity. We want people to feel safe. We think that the Abraham Accords are going to be a very big part of that. And so the way I would define or describe the Middle East is you have countries like ours who are focused on the future and we're all going towards the future. And you have a group of countries that are really preoccupied with their past and they, kept focus and they keep focusing on the past. That's really the major fault line I see in the region today the forward-looking countries versus the backward-looking countries. And I'm still going to make sure we end up on that positive note. No, oh, listen, I, I think that's, that's exactly right. And Abdallah, I mean, I'd, I'd love you to comment on the reaction in Bahrain, and, but also to sort of bring it back to the topic uh, du jour, uh, which is Iran. And I mean, the sense that, you know, you've got a regime that is a regime of the past, and yet you've got tens of millions of Iranians who want to be part of the modern world, um, who I'm sure would love to... Uh, interact with with their Israeli counterparts, um, Iranians who obviously there are a lot of Iranians who are in in the UAE. Um, there are some Iranians that are in Bahrain. Some of them who are doing positive things. Some of who are doing less than positive things. But in your sort of vision of of the Abraham Accords and the opportunities, I mean, do you see one day an opportunity to bring Iranians and their dreams and their aspirations uh, into this into this accord? Look, Mark, I think that. Uh... Uh, first of all, the uh, the Accords itself has been built on a foundation of opportunities, hope, positivity. Um, when we look at the ways in which governments can improve the quality of life for its peoples, 
uh, and you look at untapped potential, this is one of them. And that's why I think there's a, a, a lot of appetite uh, to see those MOUs uh, move forward and, um, and to see uh, the people come together and to see businessmen uh, meet with one another and, and work with one another. Um, it, it might not come as a surprise for many on the call today uh, that uh, the three countries that are actually leading the charge on uh, vaccines per populace are Israel, UAE, and Bahrain. Um, imagine how, how much work can be done just sharing information and moving forward. And so I think that uh, the Accords were uh, built with a lot of positivity in them. Um, we've always said time and time again that the Iranian people deserve that same quality of life that people are enjoying in, in, in other parts of the world and in other countries in the region as well. So uh, I, I think uh, it, it depends on where they want to go, uh, what they want to do. Um, but we have always been open. Bahrain has been an island. Um, we have people coming in and out for ages. Um, and we will continue to be the way that we always are. Um, it, it, it's going to be interesting to see what effects uh, might come out of the shift in mindset that uh, my colleagues were talking about, what opportunities that might uh, be unlocked because of uh, where we're headed. And I'm pretty sure that uh, the Iranian people will also uh, uh, one day um, want to uh, to also have a, a quality of life that's similar to ours. Well, it's amazing you, you brought up the issue of COVID vaccination. So, you know, while Israel, the UAE and Bahrain are leading the world in per capita vaccination um, campaigns and really showing, leading the way, working very closely with, with Pfizer and Moderna and, and other pharmaceutical companies, the Supreme Leader of Iran, Ali Khamenei, has banned Iranians from accessing these vaccines claiming that this is some part of some kind of U.S. you know, Zionist plot to, to infect Iranians. So it's just remarkable to see your three countries moving ahead in health and science and cooperation for peace and stability and Ali Khamenei um, really inflicting tremendous damage on his own people by denying them access to these, these vaccines. I it's mean, that might, a, yeah. Mark, the, the fissure, is, as Yusuf said before, um, the fissure in our region is not between Jews and Arabs. It's not between Shia and Sunni. It's between the forces of modernity and the forces of medievalism. And all three of us represent countries that would like to move into the modern world and to advance our societies. And there are other forces in the region, and the supreme leader of Iran is one of them, that is not interested in modernity. It wants to actually pull us back. And that's... Uh, I completely agree with it. And when the forces of modernity stand together, I think it's, uh, it's great, a great blessing for the region and pushes back against those forces that would like to draw the region backward uh, into time. Uh, and that's what makes it so exciting about this new process because it was happening you know, underneath the surface. Uh, it didn't, you know, for, for several years it was happening underneath the surface, but now in surfacing it, I think we're in a completely different new reality in the Middle East and will hopefully attract other people to allow this to, uh, to move forward. So we, I, I said uh, it, the, the other week that we're the vaccination nation, but now I hear that the race is on. So we'll have to see who gets to get the title of the vaccination nation, but it's pretty good that on one call, We've got the gold, the silver, and the bronze. We'll just have to figure out who stands where. So that's a competition that to be in the top three is not bad either. I actually think that's a great note to, to end on. I, I want to just say that it's um, on a personal level, it's been an honor uh, to know you three, to count you as good friends, um, and for uh, to see the incredible changes that you as individuals have affected um, for the region, for your people, for the United States. Uh, you, you know, you three of you deserve tremendous credit for these historical changes. Obviously, you've also got leaders who had the vision and the insight to understand that this was the way forward and to give you the, the running room to do so. But these would not have happened. These accords would not have happened with, uh, without 
Abdallah, Youssef, and Ron. So thank you. Thank you for all you've done for, for the United States, for the region, for the world. And, uh, and thanks for joining us on, on this discussion. We look forward to, to more discussions in the future.